my former students aboard a historic schooner going under the Brooklyn Bridge. I work at a maritime high school. Um, the school that I work at is called the Urban Assembly New York Harbor School. It's a maritime high school dedicated to all things um, marine, um, so you'll see some of those things. We do boat building. Um, this is, unfortunately, there are amazing pictures, but um, they're at school, and I didn't know I was doing this until Friday. So. Um, I found this on the web, but um, this is a teacher, Tizak Gomez, and a student drafting, um, doing blueprints for a boat, a Whitehall gig that they're going to build. Um, these are students in the Bahamas. This is scuba class. Um, we certify students to be scientific divers. Um, many, many students have gone through the scuba program, um, and it's pretty incredible opportunities they have in the Bahamas, in Bonaire. Um, in South Florida and in the New York Harbor, which is uh, ties directly to this uh, harbor restoration and oyster farming. Um, <coughs> I think that restoration education, um, similar to what Christie's doing, is a is a great place where educators, schools, and the corporate sector need to partner because we're all implicated in sort of how we've pillaged and destroyed our planet and we all need to be implicated in the solution and I think this is really if you want to think about how schools need to serve our society in the 21st century I think restoration curriculum is key we are um, sort of the pioneers in a billion oyster project um, replanting oysters into the New York Harbor um, oysters provide natural habitat for other um, marine marine life they also are natural water filters so they, they work to clean the harbor. And, the, and um, this is at the crossroads of a lot of what we do at the Harbor School with our experiential education. So um, we have students in coastal seamanship um, designing, basically um, charting courses so that our scuba divers can go out and plant the oyster reefs. And then we have aquaculture students um, and marine science students um, charting oyster growth. We have marine policy students who are writing the grants or um, helping to write the grants for all of this. Um, and then we also um, do ocean engineering with LEGO, um, and they're trying to design robots that can go down, um, because at times that's better than having our students diving underwater. Um, so where is math in all of this? Uh, I'm one of the founding teachers at the school. I feel very strongly about the mission and vision of our school, but I also find myself a relentless advocate for math education because I know that for us to send industry, for us, um, you know, the, the students that you all need to solve 21st century problems, they have to be well versed in math in the STEM subjects and all this other stuff, scuba diving, boat building, it's extremely, extremely persuasive, it's sexy, we're media darlings, um, but I really, this is Shalea Hicks, she's absolutely brilliant, um, you know, for anyone, you'll be seeing her at MIT or Harvard probably, um, she's one of my math students, and what happens is I have students getting pulled out to go scuba diving um, in New York Harbor, which is phenomenal, but we still have to, we have to marry these, you know, it's one of the costs of innovation. And so where does math fit in? And as a founding teacher, I've kind of charged myself with, with that question and wanting to make more authentic connections between a traditional math education and, and the types of real, real life activities that our students are immersed in. Um, and Fun for Teachers allowed me to do that. Um, and really start to build the bridge to, to create those connections between traditional math education. So going on this expedition for myself, um, these are just some tenets of what I've found as someone who's been exposed to travel from a very early age and living in different cultures, sort of things that are, are important to me and it's not a complete list, but um, I won't read it because I have a slide to represent um, how each one of these played out in my summer internship or my summer, my summer away. So I lived with this family in South Sulawesi. Um, Rahman, the father, um, was also my translator. And um, these are also themes that I try and bring back to my classroom. So in a 50-minute um, math class that meets five times a week, immersion is not always possible, but I try and give my students a holistic experience. So I was living with a family, eating with them, um, immersed in their daily lives, um, and Raman and I would go off, and um, he would help me study boats and boat building, um, and and actually 
um, start building a boat. So careful observation is critical. This person is using the bark of a tree to, um, to seal the seams of a hole um, that, he, that he's working on. Um, this is a video that's gonna start. This is an elder, and one of my main, one of the ways I wanted to make connections the most was looking at drafting and blueprints and scaling them up to math. Um, unfortunately, in South Sulawesi, although they build some of the most incredible boats, that wooden boats that you'll see, um, they do it without blueprints. Um, so he is actually drafting me right now a, a model of a Phoenici schooner. Um, and um, this is a boatyard. There are hundreds of boats along this beach um, at various stages of development. And you can hear the um, call to prayer in the background. And I will stop that and go back to, hopefully, it may start me up. Oh, sorry. I'll get you there very quickly. Um, so this is the finished product. Product You can see that he drew. Um, and this is just this idea of authentic inquiry, that you never know where your teachers are going to come from. And um, here I came in with an idea that I was really drafting, and blueprints were going to be where I was going to scale up into math content. And they don't work with, with blueprints. Um, um, honoring difference. This is, um, these are the spiritual leaders of the area. This is uh, the Amatoa people who um, live much of their life in silence. They still live in communities um, totally free of Western technology, of modern technology. Um, and they were at a party for, um, to, to bless the launch of a boat. Um, and it just means overcoming so much of sort of my own projections and what I believe I'm seeing um, in honoring differences. Here's another teacher of mine who's um, taught me how to use many tools. Um, rigorous study is a tenet of, I think, lifelong learning and expeditionary learning. And so coupled with this very active learning, um, one of the few Westerners I met on this project um, was an anthropologist who very, very generously gave me a very difficult to find um, study from the late 70s about these people. Otherwise, I couldn't find anything at all um, in print about them. Uh, two minutes? OK. Um, teaching is also really important. This is a young man I met with who wanted to know how he could figure out. He didn't have a speedometer in his boat. He wanted to figure out how he could um, know the whole speed, how he could know his maximum speed. So we went over distance rate times in something called Dutchman's Log, where you can drop something in the water and measure how long it takes your boat to pass it. Hard work. I got to work a lot on boat building. Here I'm just completely tuckered out. Um, Spontaneity. Um, this guy really wanted to play chess. He ended up being my teacher, talking to me about where the wood comes from. It's actually a tragedy. It was uh, not something I wanted to hear, but most of the wood is it's Borneo hardwoods, it's teak, um, it's ironwood, and it's mostly poached. Reflexivity is this idea in anthropology that you know this is not just egocentrism. This is the idea that we constantly have to be reflecting on ourselves as learners and the impact we have on our observations and transformation in the classroom. So going back and making these bridges. Here I am with a um, boat building teacher where this is my physics class. It's nice to see their expressions. He's much, much stronger than me. And we're having a tug of war, but I have the mechanical advantage. So we're teaching mechanical advantage. Um, and I don't have the pictures, unfortunately, but this got played out in the classroom a lot. Um, many New York Harbor School teachers have gotten Fund for Teachers grants. It has. Um, although our administration might not credit it, our boat building teacher studied traditional boats in Spain. Our scuba teacher got scuba certified to be a scuba instructor through his Fund for Teachers grant. We have art. We've had um, the history and English teacher last year did a collaborative work around um, the Marine Silk Road. So lots of stuff coming out of um, lots of interdisciplinary collaboration as a result of our participation here. And these are tough things to quantify um, on student and teacher achievement um, through the Fund for Teachers Grant. But I think it's important for us to state them outright that I think that these experiences really add to, um, well, I won't speak for any of you, to my retention in the field of education. If it weren't for opportunities like these, um, I probably would have gone back to grad school and got a PhD in physics. 
um, or that's kind of ambitious, but I would have at least thought about it. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> but um, that, that was what I was thinking. I thought I was entering teaching for four or five years, and it's, it's through these kind of, um, through these kind of experiences um, that were retained and were honored, and um, you can't underestimate the value of learning communities that are spawned from it, and I think this is a, a great example of that. So that's all. Yay. I'm really interested in this because our industry needs those divers. We need boat builders. We need people that understand maritime. Um, this is critical to our business. So I was really excited to see this, and I loved hearing about the uh, um, the oyster beds because that was such a huge issue in the Gulf of Mexico as well, and the Nature Conservancy is working a lot. So I was glad to see And I love the concept of reflexivity of going to make it a habit. <laughs> it is, seriously, is there any, where did you hear about that? Is that something you learned there? Is that something that, um, how, how will you share that with kids? Mm -hmm. Just one example of perhaps, um, you show, show the physics side. Did it impact your math lessons mm -hmm. and how did you, integrate those with the other classes because it seemed like that was one of your goals. Hey Johnny, one note a little bit here. I appreciate that last slide and I'm just wondering as you look at your students learning, um, do you sense a difference in how they solve problems, think about problems, how they actually achieve in your classroom based on the way you come back as a different teacher? Also, we actually had a guy holding up a physics and math little artifact right there, so you could see actually the mathematics he was going to apply. It's an interesting notion of is there a way, did you lose, was there something where you went back and, and helped them in, in ways such as that to help that, and having your students kind of develop things to help them to become better board builders and use the math and all the physics also, have you gone back? That's a fascinating concept for a school, and I'm just curious about how it came about. Sure. Like um, I was also really interested in, in you pointing out that you never know where your teachers are gonna, who your teachers are going to be or where they're coming from, and I think that that's such a huge aspect of lifelong learning, and that to just always be open to opportunities for learning um, outside of formalized situations. Okay, great. So we absolutely do need this in business. We're a career and technical education school. It's a paradigm we haven't talked a lot about and we haven't mentioned in this class, but it's a, it's a growing movement in contemporary education. Um, so our students get certified and have an opportunity to get certified in a number of different areas and um, a formal internship is part of it. And we do partner with business. We partner with shipping industries. We partner with environmental groups. Um, that kind of leads to where the concept came from. Um, the founder of the school, the person who had the initial idea was uh, worked with Bobby Kennedy's Waterkeeper Alliance um, and was sort of had, which is charged with protecting water, their local water bodies and it's all over the world. And so he had this idea that um, keepers have to know, sit at the intersection of all these interdisciplinary themes like science, like industry, um, like uh, boat handling. And uh, so that, that's where the idea came from. Um, I think reflexivity, um, it's, a, it's a, you know, look, read about Margaret Mead and, you know, the history of anthropology. But um, where I kind of link it and try and, try and um, make sure my students are reflexive is, is giving them the metacognitive skills to understand their place um, and contextualize what they're learning in their own lives, even if it's not directly applied, you know, if it's... Um, Pre-calculus, it doesn't necessarily apply to their current situation, but at least giving them the metacognitive um, tools to to make ask those questions and start to look for answers. Um, it has had an impact on math lessons. I mean, this is part of a larger, constant professional development that I think um, many of us embark on, which is all these experiences greatly enrich us as teachers and have a and in turn have a huge impact on my students in terms of measurable growth. I mean, my kids totally hit it out of the park on all the assessments that I like to critique, which are the standardized tests and whatnot, um, but they're also extremely engaged. They're very motivated math students, and I can't help but feel that 
I, can, I know anecdotally that these kind of experiences directly translate into that. In terms of real ways that it's played out um, this year, in addition to pre-calculus and Algebra 2, I taught an applied harbor math and science course where we, where everything was hands-on, project-based learning, and we, we got to so I got to use a lot of what I learned directly in the classroom. And that's probably time. <laughs>